And um, I tell you, everybody's still sitting in the back. I'm going to move the, a chair or a pulpit. I'm going I'm to head back that way there. There must be something better out in the back. Ooh, I sound very echoey. There we go. Uh, bring me down. You still? No. I will. I will not speak with this one here. If it's a, that's way, way like echoey up here. I sound like I'm going to blow people out of the back room. Hello, hello, test. There we. Yeah, go down. Yeah, there we go. That's much better. Perfect. All right. Can you hear me back there? Of course you can. I don't need a mic. Well, welcome this morning. And um, just a reminder, we do have a, a Sunday evening study. We'll be meeting tonight at 6 o'clock. We're going through the book of Isaiah on Sunday nights. And on Wednesday nights, we're looking into Nehemiah. So if you're able to come out on either night, um, tonight is at 6 o'clock, 6 to 7 or a little, a little thereafter. And, and Wednesday nights, we meet for prayer at 6.30, but we have a time of study as well. So I encourage you to come out on either Sunday evening or Wednesdays in addition to our Sunday uh, worship. Our live nativity is right around the corner. And so, um, again, there is, there's more than enough room for help for, we need volunteers. So please, um, if you would like to volunteer to help out, whether it be for, for baking um, and helping out with distribution of that stuff, or you want to be a shepherd or a Roman soldier, we've got all the costumes. Um, if you want to just not make sure you don't have a speaking part, we can do that for you as well. So whatever you wish to do, but please, um, it is a marvelous event. We usually have between 250 to 300 people come through in a couple of hours. It is live um, out in the, in the barn. So we have live animals and live people. And this year, I, I think we're looking for a live baby Jesus. Um, we've, had a, we've had a live baby Jesus for two years in a row. And uh, the procreation has stopped in that family. So um, we might be going to a plastic baby Jesus this year. I don't know. But um, anyway, we, we've been really blessed. We've encouraged those folks, but they, they've not listened to us. Anyway, so I encourage you to do that. And other than that, um, a reminder that on the, um, my, my head, I think the, the 30th next week, um, Nicholas Watson is going to be here. So Nicholas um, is going to be going to Argentina as a missionary. And so we're going to, Nicholas is going to come, he's going to speak, and then we're going to have a linger longer after, and um, Nicholas is going to be uh, one of our missionaries that we're going to be taking on, um, but we're going to also be blessing him next week. So please, um, come out, encourage Nicholas. Also, any questions that you may have after he speaks, we'll be having plenty of time thereafter. Um, to me, and so other stuff is in the bulletin for your reading and for your interest. And is it is at any time if you have any questions or if you know need information, give me an email, give me a shout. And for those of you who are here for the first time, or maybe you've been coming for a little bit, thank you for being here. Um, I always encourage people that when they start coming, don't don't come a Sunday or two, but but commit yourself to at least six Sundays. Come. Find out who we are. Ask a lot of questions. Not just of me, but you're more than welcome to. I'm a pretty open book. So ask questions, ask other people, and, and get to know the church. And then I do pray that if this is the place where the Lord has led you to, then plant yourselves here. Commit to the church. We don't see a lot of that today. We don't see a lot of people making commitments. But commit to the church. Commitment to the church and membership means that you have a voice. You can serve in leadership. And while we, we offer you the invitation for you to serve in any way you want alongside one of us, and who are quote unquote the members, but, but really we want to encourage you to also get involved in ministries. But, but you know, as, as we look around too, the, the church is, is aging. And so we need, we need new leadership coming in and, we, and, and fresh eyes. Um, and so we have been blessed over the years. But I encourage you. Consider, consider First Baptist to make this your home and commit yourself to this place um, and, uh, and have a voice here to the glory of God. Well, let's, let's pray. Tori, would you lead us in prayer this morning? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. I thank you for your goodness and your greatness that you have brought us here again for another week through um, a uh, week of, of who knows what, but we thank you that you are Lord of all of it and that you walk through us, uh, walk through us with us through it in all things. Lord, we praise you for you are amazing and you are greatly to be praised. And so I pray that this time as we worship you, as we bring our whole selves to you, 
that we will lay it all down at your feet, um, that you will be glorified and that the church will be edified through our singing, through our praises, and through our hearing and speaking of, of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Before Tori starts, you might remember this gentleman over here, Jim, who served in leading music for, for a few years here with us at First Baptist, is back in the area, and it really has been a, a blessing and a help. And um, Tori, of course, just battling the, the head and congestion stuff that we've all had, the, the her voice is as beautiful as ever, but wisdom tooth out on this past uh, Tuesday, and so still a little tender there, and so the gym is going to be coming to help and um, to lead us in the singing this morning. So thank you so much for being here. It's awesome to see you. Let's, let's stand and sing. To the depths of the sea Creations revealing your majesty From the colors of fall To the fragrance of spring Every creature unique In the song that it sings Exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name You are amazing God All-powerful, untamable, awestruck We fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim you are amazing God Who has told every lightning bolt where it should go Or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow Who imagined the sun and gives source to its light Yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night None can fathom Indescribable, uncontainable You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name You are amazing God All-powerful, untamable Awestruck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim You are amazing God Indescribable, uncontainable You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name You are amazing God Incomparable, unchangeable You see the depths of my heart and you love me the same You are amazing God Indescribable, uncontainable You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name You are amazing God Incomparable, unchangeable You see the depths of my heart and you love me the same You are amazing God You 
our amazing God. You see the depths of my heart and you love me the same. You are amazing God. built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fails his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Both his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. shall come with trumpet sound oh may i then in him be found dressed in his righteousness alone faultless to stand before the throne on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand on christ the solid rock i stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand Draw me close to you Never let me go I lay it all down again To hear you say that I am your friend You are my desire nothing else could take your place 
to feel the warmth of your embrace. Help me find the way, bring me back to you. was a man who came to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? <laughs> Jesus said, keep all the commandments. And the guy said, did it. I did all that. And Jesus said, then go and sell your possessions and give all of the proceedings to the poor. And at the hearing, the man went away sad. That scripture just poured into me when we're singing, you're all I want. You are all I ever needed. And when Jesus then says, great, go and do this, and then you can follow me. God help it if we go away sad, like the man. But when Jesus says, go do this, gladly, Lord, because nothing else will do. There's no one else other than you. You have drawn me to your precious bleeding side. And that's where I want to stay all the days of this life and forever with you. You are all I want. You are all I need. And in our time of prayer, sometimes we are brought to that point Right where we have trusted in so many other things that seem to have gotten us out of a jam or whatever. But then we get to a point where nothing else works and we find ourselves really understanding that not only is he more than we could ever have, he is, he is our ever-present help in time of need. 
and we are so just blessed. Marshall's here this morning through answered prayer, right? And, and you got the email out, and for those of you who didn't, Marshall was in the hospital on Friday night with blood clots in his leg that had broke off and had gone into both lungs, right? That's, that's not good, to say the least. That's not good. But the church prayed, and, and Marshall's here. I, I called him this morning expecting he's going to be in the hospital. He says, hey, how's it going? I said, well, you know, I'm wondering what breakfast you get. Oh, I just took a shower. I'm, I'm home, and I'll see you in church in a little while. And hallelujah, praise the Lord. There he is. So that's an answer to prayer. So we're just so blessed, Marshall, that the staying hand of God um, is upon you and that the church came together and prayed. And there are so many other requests we know we see, and, and Grateful Gail sends them out to us um, weekly in prayer requests that we can put them before the throne of God and to let our, our prayers go up. And we know that from the Scripture, God is attentive to his people's ear. And so um, I just want to know there, there, there are many, many more here this morning than are normally here. And that's just, a, that's really, I have to tell you, that's an encouragement. It really is. Um, when churches are wondering, we don't wonder. God's in control. And so we're really blessed that the Lord is, is leading you here. But even though we have some larger, larger numbers this morning, what is it? And I want to ask this, what is a prayer request that you have this morning that you have no control over the outcome? You're asking God to do something that only he can do. Right? Right? What is it that is on your heart this morning that you have no control over and nobody else has any control over, but only God does? And the outcome, the outcome is because of the grace of Jesus Christ. And to God be the glory, great things he hath done. So what's on your heart this morning that we can just lift up before the church this morning? And I know that, that Dale is going in on Tuesday, right, for a heart oblation. And so, you know, we, we, sometimes we think of the doctors and everything else in science, but where do we get this from? Where did, where did science, God, right? Wh whose hand is, is Dale really in? He's in God's hand. And God has, um, God fixed Dale's heart a number of years ago, right? He took out that heart of stone and put it in a heart of flesh and, and saved Dale by, by his grace. But we're, we're praying for you this, mor or this morning, Dale, for Tuesday, right? And, uh, and I'll be in the scrub room. I'm ready to go. I've been on YouTube. I'm pretty, good with, I'm pretty good with an oblation, I think. So I practiced on the car battery. I figured I can do it with a heart. Why not? So negative, positive. I'm just not sure where to connect them. But don't worry about it. You see Dale next week and his hair looks different. I'll tell you. You know, I got the, I got the poles mixed up. But we, <laughs> but we want to keep Dale, Dale in prayer on Tuesday. All kidding aside for as he goes uh, for the heart oblation. Anything else that we have this morning? Phil? Yeah, so relationships, right? God, God to come in these relationships and to, to heal relationships, to help relationships, to, to really to save people. And Phil has been talking to us and praying for people and sharing the gospel with people, but, but only God can intervene and, and really and do that work and tear, tear the veil off and, and repair what only God can repair. That's why we go to him with that. Anybody else? Anita? So for healing and all that, you bet. Yes, sir. Yes, my oldest son and my wife have recently experienced, experienced uh, medical difficulties. I hope that God can return them to full strength and relieve their stress. Amen. Amen. And your son's name? Pardon me? Your son's name? Matt. Matt. Bill. For Carol. For Carol. Yeah, and it's so good to see you, Bill, this morning. Yeah, we miss you and Carol, but, you know, Carol with, has gotten Alzheimer's, and it really has, um, really has progressed where she can't be here anymore. Um, but we're, good to, we're glad to see you. We'll keep you, and, and certainly Carol, in prayer this morning. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, we don't even try to describe you. We look into your word, and we know that we can 
perhaps get a glimpse when we can look into the heavens and they declare your glory and your majesty. All creation, all creation speaks of who you are. And yet, Lord, you tell us from your word that we are not to imagine in our minds what you look like or to craft with our hands anything that might become an idol. And so, Lord, you are indescribable, uncontainable. And so we are awestruck and we fall to our knees. Perhaps we are astonished that the God of all creation who holds the stars in his hands, who said to the seas, I set the boundaries and you can go no further, who can command the wind and the waves to be still and they must listen, who as with Peter can speak to the fever and say be gone and, the, and healing takes place. How can we describe you? The one who gives sight to the blind and make the deaf hear can cause the lame to walk and the deaf to rise again. You're indescribable and you're uncontainable. No man could have ever, could have ever done what you have done. And here we are, your church, blossoming and blooming, coming to praise you, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, the name that is above all other names. And this morning, Lord, we praise you. God, we praise you for answered prayer. Lord, we thank you that in your perfect and pleasing will, you sought fit to preserve Marshall's life and to lead him out of the hospital sooner than, than many. And yet, Lord, here he is here today, praising you and worshiping you, strong in his body and more strong than in his heart. And Lord, how we rejoice to have him here this morning. Lord, we rejoice that, that Bill is here this morning. And yet, Father, our hearts do grieve that Carol cannot be with him from this terrible disease of the mind in Alzheimer's. Lord, how it robs a person. And yet Carol knows you and she loves you. And more important, you know her and love her. And so, Father, we pray for Carol and the days that you have for her, Lord. Keep her mind in such a way that she would recognize her husband and his tender touch. But most important, Lord, that even though familiar faces may fall away. Lord, you be fresh in her mind that she would praise you and thank you all the days of her life. For Bill, continue to strengthen him, Lord, as he ministers to his wife. Thank you, Lord, for bringing him here. He has been missed. And Lord, we rejoice at his coming here today. Father, for Dale, we, we think of the oblation that he'll have on Tuesday and God, we thank you that you have already rescued him from anything that can come his way. And Lord, we thank you for all who are in Christ. You have gone on to prepare a place so that where you are, we may also be forever with you. But we're praying, Lord, that this oblation will be successful, that Father's heart will be put back into normal rhythm again. And Father, that will strengthen him up and he would, he would find rest and, and the strength, Lord, that he had before this affliction came upon him. So God, how we pray for your hand, your healing hand upon him, and to be with those that you have gifted to provide the surgery and the anesthesia and the comfort before and thereafter. Minister unto his wife, Gail, and strengthen her, Lord, for her husband's needs. Father, we think of, of Isabel, who's here with us, and Lord, we rejoice in the certificate that she has had and the, the medical program, Lord. And now as she'll be heading off to Japan, Lord, for further training and to put to use the gift that you've given to her. God, we rejoice at, at her singing. And, but Lord, we pray for her. We continue to pray for her that you strengthen her up, that she would use the gift to your glory. 
and that she would be a help to many, to many who would come under her care, watch over her, and keep her, Lord. Father, we think of Anita and in her dad and, and the cancer um, that he has and in her brother who is going to have to have part of his liver, liver removed, Lord. Father, we would pray for healing for the brother there and for her father, if that would be your will. Because in all of these requests, Lord, we are seeking your perfect and pleasing will. Thy will be done, Lord. And that's a hard prayer to pray. Father, we think of those who are afflicted with illness, sons and wives. And Lord, whether that illness be in body or in mind, so many afflicted today, Lord. But you are the great healer who can heal everything. For with you, nothing is impossible. In relationships that Phil has brought before us, you can bring about healing and restoration and reconciliation. But the most important relationship we pray, Father, for those within our families, for our friends, for those in the workplace and our neighbors. God, how we pray for relationship between the unsaved and the one who can save, Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. Father, our hope in life and in death is Christ. And so I, I pray, Father, that as we even proclaim your, your name in worship this morning and in singing, that as we sing these words, Lord, that, Father, they are offered up to you in faith, that in hope, in life and death, it's Christ and Christ alone. Tori. souls to him belong who holds our days within his hand what comes apart from his command and what will keep us to the end the love of christ in which we stand oh sing hallelujah our hope springs Everlasting life. 
life with him and we will rise to meet the lord then sin and death will be destroyed and we will feast in endless joy when christ is ours Well, if you have your copy of God's Word with you, would you turn to Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. Matthew 9, verses 35 through 38. The Bible says that Jesus went through all the towns and villages. What was he doing? He was teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and then he's healing every disease and sickness. There were crowds. And so the Bible says that when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Why did God save you? Why did God save you? If you're wondering about that, there's an answer this morning. Now, if I were to go around the, the room today and ask you, why did God save you? Why did God save you? I would imagine that in a, in a gathering of such numbers that we would probably have several different responses. So we won't do that this morning. But why did God save you? Let me give you the reason why God saved you. The Bible tells us that we, what, what, are his workmanship. And we have been created in Christ Jesus unto good works. God has formed us for mission. He has saved us to do his mission. That's why God saved you. The byproduct is, yes, everlasting life with Christ. Abundant life here in a relationship with Christ. But he saved us because we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, according to the scriptures, unto good works. And the Apostle Paul said that the Philippian church, being confident of this very thing, that he who begun a good work... And you will complete it. He's working on us. We are all a work in progress. We are being conformed more and more to the image of Christ every day. That's the prayer we should be. But he has set us on a mission. And I want to talk to you today about what this looks like. This being formed for mission. And I've said it before and we are so blessed we are so blessed that we have Anita and she's getting ready to go back to Africa. We're not blessed that you're going back to Africa. But the people of Africa are going to be blessed that you're going back to Africa. To share Christ and to do the work that God created in you. Right? And we are so blessed that we can help Nicholas Watson as he's preparing for Argentina. God began a good work in him. And he's going to complete it. He's created you all, right, unto good works. Created you in Christ Jesus to do the work of God. But everyone around, everybody else, right, hang on. 
Because I hope that today when you walk out, you will not just look at the clock and say, he went over again today, but you will look up at the, the letters above the clock that says, you are now entering the mission field. We have been saved to go out and do the work that Christ has created in us. And the Bible says we have cre he has created us unto a good work. Jesus says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. So no work of mine in it by itself is any good. But every work of God in us is a good work. And he has saved us to do that work. And so this, this mission that God has called us to is not anything that I come up with. I can't do it. You can't do it either, nor should we. It's his mission. This is the easiest thing. He's like, that's relaxing. I don't have to come up with a mission. God's already done it. In fact, I don't have to come up with a method. Because in the mission of Christ, he shows us his methods. And in his method, he also reveals his message. This is great news. This is all packaged up. He's given us the curriculum. All we have to do is sit down, learn it, and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, be taught, and then go do it. This is fairly simple stuff. And there's only three main things that the mission of Jesus covered. He was a minister who cared for all people. His mission is a caring mission. The Bible says so in verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages. He's teaching in the synagogues. He's proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. And he's healing every disease. He's demonstrating compassion. The second thing in verse 36, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Because why? They were weighed down by life. They were harassed and all kinds of things coming against them. And he looks at them and he says, wow, you guys are like sheep that have no shepherd to care for you, to lead you. You would wander off anywhere you go. And Jesus has compassion upon those but then, this is the great thing. In verses 37 and 38, he gives us the best vision. This is, I said this before. So people say, Pastor, what's your vision? I don't have one. Really? No. God does. That's my vision. Whatever God has, that's my vision. Whatever his mission is, that's my mission. And if I'm on his mission, I have to have his vision. Otherwise, I start to sprinkle myself in God's stuff, and that really looks, that doesn't go very well. I've done that before. It doesn't go well at all. I can tell. I sound like Trump for a moment. It doesn't go well at all. <laughs> anyway, at least I'm not walking around like this. Anyway, caring for all. I'm just caring for all. But then he has this vision in verses 37 to 38. And he says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Okay, what are we going to do? Well, then ask the Lord. Hey, church, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. That's the vision. So we have the mission. And we're going to see his method. And we have the vision here. His method is only one. He reached people. That was his method. And when you think about what Christ did, he went out after people. He went into the cities and the towns and the villages, the Bible says. And he went into their, into their synagogues. I mean, what in the world was he doing? This is the Son of God. You would think that Jesus, of all people, would have gathered this like, little group of people that he had. And then said, okay, guys, listen. You sit here and teach and everybody's just going to come. You don't have to do anything. People are just going to come. But when you look at the life of Christ, though, at times there were multitudes that were all around him. In the very end, he looked around and then they all gone away. 
And he looks at his few and he says, will you also leave? And they say, where else can we go? Where are we going to go? But he didn't sit around thinking that people are just going to flood to him. He didn't wait. And the scripture bears out why he did not wait and why he went after. For he says, the son of man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And the silliest thing that the church can do is to sit back and just think, they're just going to come. We don't have to do anything. They're just going to come. In fact, I mean, it, as I said earlier, it really is. It's a blessing after COVID and so much more that everybody went through. And we looked at sometimes we had we had for a little, we had cardboard cutouts in the pews. Right? Darcy and Dave were the culprits behind that. Um, but you know, to look at these that we see here today, it really is a blessing. It's it's an amazing blessing. But this is the illusion that you know what? Hey, people are just coming. We don't have to do anything. He's just bringing them. Now, some people will come. Some people will. But the majority will not. And let me share this. Those of you who are here, and I've gotten to know most of you, I could say that you stand on Christ the solid rock, that he's your Lord and Savior. But the ones who won't come are the ones who are on sinking sand. They don't know Christ. And you say, well, why won't they come? Because they don't know to come. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. But how will they hear unless somebody tells them without a preacher? You say, well, that's your role, brother. No, we're going to find out in just a minute that there's a big difference in the, the definition of preaching than what we think preaching actually is. They will not come. They don't know how to come. So Jesus says, my mission was to go after the lost. And your mission is to go after the lost. So he tells us, go ye therefore and teach all the nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. He said again. Peace be unto you as my father hath sent me, even so I send you. He is a sending God. And the, so you can say, okay, so we're to go out, but where do we go? Right? Kind of like the scarecrow in the Wizard of Oz. Which way do I go? Right? And kind of that's true. It doesn't matter. You can go anywhere. Because that's what Jesus did. In fact, Jesus went, he went everywhere. There wasn't a place that Jesus did not go. In Matthew 9, 35, the Bible says that he went everywhere in all the cities and the villages. In Matthew 5, in verse number 1, we find Jesus going into the countryside. But we flip back to the 35th verse of Matthew 9. We find him now not only in the cities and in the villages, but we find him in the synagogues. Hey, flip all the way back to Matthew 5.1. You'll find him not only on the countryside, but you'll find him up on the mountains, plural. In Matthew 4.18, you'll find him by the seashore in boats. In Matthew 8, 23, you'll find him by the graveyards or in the graveyards. I got to tell you that I was sharing with the church this morning earlier on that the greatest place to share the gospel is at a funeral. I get calls oftentimes people, uh, they don't have a church. They don't have a church because they're, they're not Christians. They don't go to church. They don't, they're not with the church. And, and I've done funerals for, for sadly uh, young, young teenage, young teenage men. One I did, he was, he was 18 years old, OD'd on fentanyl. 
And, and there in the front row is his mother and his father who's, who's in women's clothes. Trans, right? Transvestite, transgender, whatever they are. And, and the whole room, you can look around that room and say there's nobody. You could say that. There's nobody in Christ. That's okay. You know why? I, I say it that way because now's the opportunity. Share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, every time I've done one of those, I've had somebody come up and say, Pastor, you look around this room, and where else will they hear the gospel? And I, I'm always astonished because God always puts somebody there as well who does know Jesus. But then when you look at the word of God, you can say, how else will they hear the gospel? Well, hey, how about you? Don't look to a, a, a preacher to come to a funeral service. How about you? What have you been doing with the crowds that don't know Jesus. He went to the graveyards. We see that he went to, he, were, he was in homes. He visited uh, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He went into the homes of, of, of the prostitute. He went and, and he ate with tax collectors. He, hey, there's a wedding. Jesus says, I'm going. I'm going. He was everywhere. There was no place that Jesus did not go to minister to people who needed him. He cared for them. He had compassion on them. And he went everywhere to reach them to the glory of God. And so he tells us in Matthew 22, go into the highways and as many as you shall find, call them to the marriage supper. How do I do that? Well, if you're mine, Jesus would say, have you not received the power of of the Holy Spirit who dwells within you. And so go, proclaim the gospel in your Jerusalem and in your Judea. And you ready for this one? And your Samaria. And that Samaria is where people are so violent to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But this is marvelous about Jesus. He's, listen, start off in Jerusalem. Start off with those who, they don't know me, but they're, they're, they may be receptive. I don't know, but you start with them. And, and then move out from there. I'll, I'll increase your size. Because ultimately, I'm going to lead you to people that hate me. And because they hate me, they hate you. He says, I'll lead you to those. Jesus went to the most violent places with the vilest of people. And you know where I think the most violent place with the vilest of people that G, where Jesus went? You know where I think it is? I think it's his hometown. They couldn't wait for Jesus to come. Remember in Luke, you're reading it, and, and it says, and he went unto Nazareth, which is his hometown, and he went into the synagogue as was his custom. Jesus went to church, right? I mean, the Lord of the church. And here he is in the synagogue. It was his custom. It means that he went to be. And, and he had to listen to other teachers. He wasn't the only guy. In the synagogue, they would open it up. And hey, if someone was in town, they would invite that person in to open up the scriptures. And, and they would have a, a teaching of the scriptures of the word of God. Well, Jesus goes into his hometown and of course, his hometown are all excited that Jesus is coming because this is the, this is the guy that's healed the blind. He's caused the, the deaf to hear and the lame to walk. He's even, he has even caused people to rise from the dead. Hey, can you guys book Jesus for the synagogue on the third whatever? And they just can't wait. And if you read the scripture, I'm not kidding you. All eyes are on this place is jammed. I mean, it's packed full. And Jesus opens up the scriptures. And then uh, he says, hey, at this hearing, right, the scripture's fulfilled. He says, uh, he said to his hometown, I I'm, I'm surprised. I'm, I'm not from Curtis Lumber. I'm not the carpenter. I'm, I'm, I'm not Joseph's son. I'm the son of God. Well, he couldn't get that one around him. So he gives him a description from the Old Testament. And what he said to all of them right there. He says, hey, by the way. Um, God didn't heal one of you all. He went to the Gentiles. And then they got a hold of him. 
And they tried to cast him over. Violent to the scripture. Violent to what Jesus was saying. Vile in what they were doing. But the Bible says that Jesus walked through the midst of them. How'd that happen? I don't have a clue. I have no idea, but we know he did. He'll send us to the violent and to the vilest places because he went to the most violent and vilest places himself. But he gives us some lessons in his method and in his mission in this place of ministry. Some lessons that we have here. We should go everywhere. He went to the existing establishments. So when you say, well, he went to the synagogue, that was the existing establishment. He went there. But we have a lot of establishments that exist where we can go into and preach the kingdom of God. Jesus, they were, they were open to him. I had a friend of mine years ago I was in seminary with. He was from deep Louisiana. If you didn't pay attention, if you didn't pay attention, you couldn't understand him. I'm telling you, you just couldn't. Well, he was talking about a time where he would drive past, on his way to go, to go preach on Sundays, he would drive past a bar room. And he said, 9.30, 10 o'clock in the morning, that bar room is jam-packed. And he said, the doors were always closed. So he said, I started to pray. He said, you know what, Father? He said, I go to church every Sunday. He says, I can't get a crowd like the bar rooms get. But he said, every Sunday, the doors to that bar room are closed. He said, if you open up a door to a bar room and I drive by, he says, I promise you, I will go in and preach Jesus in that place. He said, next Sunday, that barroom door was open. He said, and I pulled off, and he went in. He says, and there's the guys at the, at the, at the bar there, and they're smoking and drinking and doing whatever the guys are doing. And he said, I asked where the owner is, and they said he's back in the back room. And he said, I went in there and, and introduced myself. And he says, may I have 10 minutes? And the owner says, to do what? He says, I want to preach Jesus to those men at the bar. He said, the bar room owner says, you got 10 minutes. If you don't leave after 10, I'll throw you out. He goes, it's a deal. He says, I preached Christ to them. Not one of them gave their life to Christ. He says, I walked out in my car. He says, I praised God for the open door. And then he said, Lord, if it would be your will, I pray you just take that establishment out completely. If they won't come to Christ, then remove that from this community that it will draw people away from you. He says, I'm not kidding you. The following week, he said, or during the week, lightning hit that bar room and burned it to the ground. So we go everywhere. And when there's an open door, when there's an establishment, go in there. You never know where God is leading you. But there are some places we won't go. I'm not going to that part of town those people aren't like us they don't look like us they don't speak like us they don't behave us like us I'm not going to that part of town I'm better than they are but Jesus Tells us something different. He says, I went everywhere. He says, I went to the lowest to let them know that in me they are the highest. And I went to the highest to let them know that without me they are the lowest. He went everywhere. He went to those that the world did not love. He touched those and held those that the rest of the world were afraid of. Back then, it was the lepers. Earlier in the 80s and 90s, for some of us who have been around for a while, it was the victims of AIDS. Sadly, today, if you got COVID, <gasps> you're like lepers or people with AIDS. But Jesus said, you come 
and he held them. He had compassion on them. He says, you go everywhere. You go to the mansions. You go to the slums. You go. He went everywhere. He even goes to people that are secure in their religion. I was probably one of the most faithful Catholic boys you'd ever met. Secure in my religion. Till the grace of God came. And I found out how much religion fails. And how far reaching God's grace is through Jesus Christ. But what did he do? He worked. He worked. Remember, he's created in us a good work. And we are created in him unto good works. What work did he do? Well, he taught and he proclaimed and he healed. He had a threefold work that he was doing. And that's our primary guide for us. It's a threefold work that we do. The first thing that he do was he, he preached. Well, there you go, brother. That's all up to you. Uh-uh. That's not up to me because preaching goes far, so far than just this. And, and can I just share something with you? Remember last week? I think it was last week. I, I, I asked a couple of questions. And some of you responded. Remember that to the questions? I can't find in my Bible where Jesus went out and he read the scripture. But everywhere you see... What was going on? People were asking him questions. And he was answering. You see, he spoke the word of God. He proclaimed it. But people have questions. And they're, and they're engaging. And so in that preaching of the salvation and redemption to humanity... He sat down and he begins to teach the people. And the people are engaged. Preaching alone doesn't work. Because preaching alone just sends information out to you, right? Teaching, though, if you take what you have. And can I encourage the parents out there today? And even those who are, whatever you hear, talk about it on the way home. Do you know what was being said today? Open up the scriptures and sit down because what does that do? Paul said that the Colossian church, you're to be rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught. Colossians 2, 7. So, so teaching then takes the preaching and it grounds it. It roots the preaching. So, so uh, here we have this, this, this classroom. I've heard something, but even being taught, ah, it's still not good enough. So he says, I'm going to accompany healing with that. And so here it is. There's every person gathered today, including myself, is not exempt from needing the healing power of Almighty God. Because everybody in this room today, I'm sure, you came here with something. It might be, it's, it's weighing down, Dale. He's got to go Tuesday. And even though as much faith as you have in the Lord Jesus Christ, the truth is, it's easy for the rest of us. Hey, Jay, we're praying for you. Everything's going to be good. But you're going to be on that table. Right? You're trusting yourself, yes, in the Christ. But you've got other people working on you. And Marshall. We can pray, all these other things. But you know what? Healing has to take place. There's a lot going in in people's minds right now. Emotional healing, psychological healing, relationships. Sometimes it's physical healing. We pray for physical healing. Right? God heals those who are afflicted physically. And so Jesus includes this into the physical and to the mental and to the emotional needs of those who, who hurt and who suffer and so he says in the things as Paul writes to Timothy and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses thou shalt commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others and he says to Timothy I'm telling you you take this word of God and you proclaim it you proclaim it whether people want to hear it or whether they don't want to hear it 
and you take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and you reprove and you rebuke and you exhort with all long suffering in doctrine. Because what is preached needs not only to be taught, but it must be lived out. If you are in agreement with me this morning that we have been formed for mission and that we have been saved, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, and that he has begun in us a good work, isn't it true then that when we are trained up in all of this, we are to go and do what God has called us to do. Isabel, you're going to Japan. You did really wonders, right? All of your studies and all of this. I mean, excelled in high school, excelled in your, your tests and all of that. Excelled, excelled. Love the Lord Jesus Christ. Why did he give you that gift? Use it to his glory. And in using that in the healing that God will cause you to do through medical wonders and all that that you'll do. Share Jesus Christ. Let people know that God began this good work in me and he's seeing it through and I'm here today because I've been created in Christ Jesus, a good work to use it to the glory. Whatever God's given you, use it to his glory and go tell people about Jesus. And so it needs to be lived out what God has to say he wants proclaimed and taught so that many people may know how to live. How to live. Well, I'm going to close out there today. And next week we're going to continue on about the errors that preaching alone will bring. The errors that teaching alone will bring. And the errors that healing alone will bring. There are errors in just keeping that. And then we'll move into the message of Almighty God. But, my dear friends, for us to think that we are to sit around while the world is going to hell, how can we justify that? How can we say, well, God's going to bring them here? Some, yes, most, no. You are now entering the mission field. I stole a slogan a number of years ago. I already asked God for forgiveness of it. But I had it there. It was like, enter to worship. The church gathers together to worship the Lord. That's what we're here for, to worship him, to praise him. Yes, to, to learn from the teaching of the word of God. But now, when we leave this place, the church... We enter to worship. We depart to serve. That's what we are to do. And I'm going to do something a little different. And we're going to close with a, a doxology that's familiar. But I want to read to you today a portion of scripture that I really believe encompasses all of the singing today. Encompasses what we've heard from God's word today. But the Bible says in Colossians chapter 1, he, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. And in him all things consist or hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything he might have the preeminence. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, 
by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. start with some almonds. people groups and make disciples of all the nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you unto the end of the age. We now enter the mission field to God's glory. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 God bless you.